great at the top. Uh, Dr. Lee is a professor of epidemiology and neuroscience um, at the Melman School of Public Health in Columbia University. He is a genetic epidemiologist with extensive research experience in conducting integrative genomic studies. He has carried out or is currently involved with genetic studies of aging, Alzheimer's disease, and Alzheimer's disease related traits, Down syndrome, environmental factors, and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Lee's research is focused on unique high risk cohorts in different parts of the world, including Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Kazakhstan, Finland, New York City, etc. Dr. Lee is co investigator in both the Diana Wellbeing Study and the Columbia University of Guyana Research and Injury and Trauma Training for Grids Program. Um, when, when it's up, okay. you just use the school. Okay. And I hope it works. All right. We'll see. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So I'd like to say that th I prepared this talk for young scientists in Guyana so that hopefully this will inspire some of you to go into science instead of uh, going to a uh, business. So, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about three things, three experiments that I've done, and hopefully that will give some insight to uh, how to do a genetic study in the environment that you're in. and and. I'm going to focus on the more conceptual issues rather than technical details, because technical details needs money, whereas thinking does not require any money. So let's let's start cheap. Okay. All right, that's me, Jolie. Uh, I'm going to be talking about healthy aging and dementia. Uh, so it's a step away from suicide. And the opposite end of suicide is healthy being, since that's the name of the conference, and I thought it was proper. And then when you're not getting healthy aging, then you get dementia, which is a terrible thing. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three experiments I've done on this. OK, so what's the problem? It's Alzheimer's disease. And it's the biggest health problem in elderly. And it's costing about $277 billion a year in developing countries. <laughs> so as you can see in the graph, that every part of the globe, whether it's America, Asia, or Africa, or anywhere else, the amount of money that we're spending on healthy aging and, and to tackle dementia is going up. And, and that's important because, and on the right most graph, as you can see, the population in Guyana is growing old uh, and the life expectancy has been going up, which means that, and, and that's the life expectancy, which means that 50% of the population will be, reach that age. And there would be a small portion of people will go beyond that. And you still have to worry about Alzheimer's disease when you are above 70 years of age. So let me just give you a brief explanation on what Alzheimer's disease is. Alzheimer's disease is a memory problem, followed by language and orientation and moral function and all sorts of things that prevent you from having a normal daily activity. And this is a picture, self-portrait that this artist, Swedish artist drew uh, about eight years after he was uh, uh, having problems. And that's at the end, that's right before he died. And that's how he sees himself. So you can see the progression of clinical manifestation of this disease, which is not, not so nice. Uh, so, so let me tell you a little bit about what's while the clinical uh, things are going on on surface, these are the things that's going on in your brain. So in the brain, it's accumulating amyloid beta, and that's called flax. And then there is something called tangle, which is neurofibrillary tangle that's forming in the brain. And when that happens, 
there is a change in blood flows uh, such that that you can see that there is a rad, drastic change in amount of glucose that that flows through your brain, and and when all these things happen to you, and your brain neurons die and your brain shrinks and it's not a good thing you don't want to have a you want to have a large brain so that if something goes wrong there's a way around it because other neurons take over the jobs that the other one was doing so i just want to point out that long before you see signs of memory impairment things are happening in the brain already as one of the gentlemen asked how early should you start doing these things well you got to do it and here is the story. And this is what you're seeing on the clinical end. Things are going wrong. And then your family members start seeing these bad things. And while this thing is going on, looking at the mid picture as a time of diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, all the biochemical changes in the body has been happening 20, 30 years ago. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why it's important to do a study longitudinal study because all these things start happening 20, 30 years ago. So if you had a blood sample on general population, you're, you're gonna be able to go back and start looking at how things happen. And this is a really good thing because by then, 20, 30 years later, all the things that's gonna be so much cheaper because technology has advanced so rapidly that all the things that you could do that could would cost million dollars will cost thousand dollars. So you have to think about long-term changes over time and how to understand that. Uh, so, so in addition to what is happening in the brain biochemically, these are the epidemiologic risk factors that you uh, see in Alzheimer's disease. Things in black, you can change because you cannot not get old. You cannot be a male or female because biologically you're born, sociologically you may change, but ethnicity, you are what you are. Uh, but the things in blue, those are the things that you can actually change. Educational level protects against Alzheimer's disease. Cardiovascular disease can be protected by diet and exercise and all the other things. Now, genetic susceptibility by itself will do some damage in your brain, and then it may interact with the environmental factors that you're experiencing putting in your body. So these are other things that are also need to be taken into consideration. Okay, so why study genetics? Well, I study genetics because that's what I got trained on. And, and you know, once you get your PhD in genetics, then you're stuck. Uh, so and the, the beauty of that is that 60% of Alzheimer's disease has genotypic variants. Uh, variance, genotypic variance is explained by genetic components, which is a reasonably large proportion. And it's not the one major gene that causes everything, but it's many genes with each gene having small impact on the phenotypic outcome. And these many genes work with each other and they each genetic factor has a small effect size. And then that causes a problem when only each single gene causes only 1.5 times higher risk and 2. Point times higher risk. Then what that means is that statistically speaking, you need a large sample size study to figure out which genes are affected. And so uh, since I'm fundamentally cheap, I try to find a cheaper way to do the same thing. And the cheaper way to do the same thing is look at the highest risk population. One is Down syndrome. People have three chromosomes on 21, and the third chrom the, the chromosome 21 has a gene called APT, which makes plaques. And, and, and then I study PS1 because those people have amyloid making PS1 gene that causes excess uh, uh, production of this uh, protein. So, so far, this is what we know about Alzheimer's disease and how genes contribute to the biology. And what we know quite well is that, yes, there are plaques and 
tangles that will kill your neurons, which is not good for you. And then there are other things that are, as you can see, uh, uh, I can't, uh, can you see the pointer? Yes. Okay. So, and then, okay. On upper right, you see the lipids involved in the whole process. And, and there is neuroinflammation that also happens in the brain when uh, uh, genes makes proteins that will alter the, the neuro, uh, neurological environment in the brain. And the, at the lower right hand, there is cholesterol that also messes up your brain as well. So there are many, many network of things happening in your brain over 20, 30 years, and these things are happening, and the genes allow you to understand the mechanism by which these things happen. So why is it difficult to study Alzheimer's disease in humans? And it's because, as you can see on the top right graph, when you see that, you know, if you want to see a trait as memory decline or Alzheimer's disease, there is a gene you want to find, but you don't know where that gene is. So you have to find the genetic markers that are nearby and then any genetic markers that are associated with the disease trait. And that's gonna give you some hint as to which genes are involved. While if that was the only thing, a gene was the only thing that you have to worry about, life is pretty simple. However, there are complications. What are the complications? There are family environment, individual environment, genetic background, because you have a different ancestry than other people. And then you have community, you have cultural things that are all putting in to the same pot where the things are very hodgepodge mixed, uh, a compl complex soup of materials that goes into it. So trying to understand this many to many relationship is quite difficult. So, so that's why I advocate natural experiment where we study where, and, and then this shows how all the traits, memory impairment, amyloid beta, all these things are all correlated, triggering one another. So when you have these complex relationships, Okay, so things are messy, complicated, so what? So then the question is, can we use genetic markers to predict when or whether you're gonna have Alzheimer's disease? And then I'm gonna give you one experiment that we have done using healthy aging cohort to say it's not so easy. So, so far, this year, early this year, there was a paper in Nature Genetics that showed that a meta study that studied 800,000 people's genome and looked to see which genes are involved in the Alzheimer's disease risk. And they identified 75 genes that are contributing to Alzheimer's disease risk. And some genes in the, had more than one variant. That's why there are 83 variants that are associated with Alzheimer's disease that are late onset. And then each of these things cost anywhere between one to 2.4 risk ratio, which is pretty modest at best. And then when you put it all together, that, that all 83 genetic variants into a single model, and then I genotype all your 83 SNPs, and then calculate your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, it tells you that, hey, in the worst case scenario, you may have twofold increase in disease of Alzheimer's disease, the meaning that the remaining, you have absolutely not. Oh. Oh. Okay. So I don't how to do it. Working with me, so okay. So the, the beauty is though, even though it it doesn't tell you a heck of a lot about how much risk has been elevated, it gives you all the other mechanisms by which these things happen. 
so that we know that lipid metabolism is involved. And then if we can lower the lipid metabolism in some way, we, we may be able to ameliorate the, 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 the risk of developing dementia later in your life. And, and, and so this gives you some ideas about mechanism by which these things happen. Okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna give you one example of our healthy aging study where we collected uh, 450 families where each family had to have at least two people who are approaching 100 years of age. And there are some families that more than four or five centenarians. So these are really healthy stock of people. They live to 100 and they don't get chronic disease. They, have, they don't have diabetes, they don't have Alzheimer's disease, they don't have anything. They're, they're sort of like a Superman. So, and then we looked at those families to see, and then we applied those 83 genetic markers. When we get those markers tested on those super aging cohort, can we still predict who's going to develop Alzheimer's disease? That was a question I raised and, and my postdoc answered. Answer is no. When we applied to these healthy people, these genetic markers didn't do a thing. As you can see, the difference in those people who have uh, uh, ADM versus not, the, their score of genetic risk was more or less comparable. So it shows the, the reason is out of 83 genetic markers, only four of those were significantly associated with Alzheimer's disease in that super aging cohort. So when you have a sampling that is fundamentally different from the general population, games off, right? Come on. It's just rotating. Going by so. Can you help me here? Yeah. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah, okay, that's it. So here you're going to see that only four SNPs that were significantly associated out of 83, showing that in certain populations, these SNPs don't do, they have a different kind of effect size of association with Alzheimer's disease and, and their allele frequency differ compared to the general population. And then on the right, you can see that uh, when you look at all 83, you see that things that are in red increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Things that are in green actually works against Alzheimer's disease. So in this healthy aging cohort, the same SNP has a different direction of association in these healthy people. In addition, when you look at APOE4 is the best known late onset disease risk factor. And as you can see on the right, that if you see African American in the United States, their APOE4 allele frequency is 26%. On the other hand, when you scroll down to third box, you see that Asians APOE4, their allele frequency is anywhere between six to 8%. And then, Obviously, the American Indian is somewhere in between, and the, the white population in Boston have 12% allele frequency E4. So that when you have a really different allele frequencies for these risk factors, you know that they're going to have a different impact on their risk. And, 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 and the thing is, oh, African-American has 26% allele frequency. So, you know, 
there in a, in a deep doo-doo? Uh, not really, because I'm going to show you uh, in the next experiment why you should not panic. OK. Oh. Another thing that I wanted to show is that in Washington Heights, our, uh, uh, our colleagues did a study in, of Alzheimer's disease in uh, uh, whites, black, and Hispanics. And you can see that in, in whites, it increases the risk by 2.5. In African Americans, it doesn't do anything. In Hispanics, it's a little bit higher. And then you can see this is a cumulative incidence of an Alzheimer's disease over time. And you can see that the, 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 the blue bar represents those people without E4 on the lower bar and the, with E4 on the higher bar. So the difference in cumulative incidence represents the risk associated with E4 in whites. Now, let's see what happens in black population in Washington Heights. And what you see is that, come on. On the left, when you do the relative risk, the risk ratio is 1.0, meaning nothing. However, when you look at the absolute risk, there is still substantial difference. However, in African-American, because their baseline risk is so high, the relative risk becomes trivial. Right? So, so you have to be very careful when you're doing this ethnic difference in these studies. OK, so what? My point is, do your own study on your own population. So we discovered this mutation in PS1 in Puerto Rico in 2001. It's highly penetrant, it's highly variable, blah, blah, blah. And when you look at the uh, protein level uh, compared to Swedish APP mutation, it's only half as bad as uh, a Swedish mutation. And then, then, so I decided to take this as my uh, career. And then I decided to look to see everything about PS1. And this is what I learned. If you have a PS1 mutation, Everybody thinks that you have also dominant uh, uh, disease gene mutation, so you're going to get disease and you're screwed. And then when I looked at there are 300 different kinds of mutations in PS1. Some mutations have average age of onset in their 30s. Others have average age of onset at 60. Once you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, some mutation, you live about, you die within first five years. Others, you live 20 years without any problems. So what gives? So in my Puerto Rican study, we went family by family, and the dot in the middle represents the mean age at onset in that family that carries PS1 mutation. The range shows what the age of onset is in that family. So as you can see that some families are predominantly early onset, some people, are, some families are predominantly late onset, and the ones in the middle, it goes all over the place. So these people have the same PS1 mutation, G206, the glycine to alanine, yet their phenotypic expression varies widely as you can see, see in the middle. And they, you have to remember that they have all have the same mutation. So when you're looking at these high-risk population, the single gene disorder is not so simple where you have to think about lots of wide variation. So what I do is I look at the extreme right end with a PS1 mutation or Down syndrome group they have three copies of APP gene, and you look at those people, and then if they don't discover, they, if they don't show any Alzheimer's disease in their 70s, then there's something unique about you. Why the heck aren't you demented? You should be demented, and that's a good thing, right? 
And then we looked at all the environmental factors and we cannot find environmental factors that protects against this PS1 mutation. So then we sequenced the whole genome doing whole genome sequencing and we screened the entire genome from chromosome one to 22 and sex chromosome and find there are some protected genes that are incredibly powerful. And then having those genes may delay onset by 10 to 15 years. So those are protective genes. So that even though you have these things, and then once we discover these modifier genes in the high risk population, then we go over to the left, these centenarians, they don't die or they don't get disease. And then my reasoning is that those people should have a higher frequency of those protective mutations and their effect size may be even higher than what you see in the general population. Now, do I see that? I... So, come on. Yeah, so I, I said all that. Unaffected age 70. Why the heck aren't you? How did you escape it? I guess that's a little more as elegant than the way I put it. Uh, and and some of these variants be protected. Uh, and then and then I can do the same thing if I find the protective variants in the PS1. I look at Down syndrome because they both go to amyloid pathway uh, disease. And then say, and then the last thing is what I just said about looking at the centenarian study. And then, so then I went to Puerto Rico and this is the kind of family that I see in Puerto Rico because in a valley, you know, they, they marry each other. And then, so if you have a mutation because they're marrying family members, the frequency goes up. And so then, then I turn my uh, uh, direction to Guyana, given the complexity and the uniqueness of the population, and you have these other factors where you have religiosity in a different degree, where 60% are Christians and 25% Hindus and 6% Islam. And, and when you have these different cultural backgrounds, and then you have the same gene, how is the gene and environment work together to result in cognitive impairment or anything else? And one of the cognitive impairment may be suicide attempt or whatever. So, And here you see all the, the things that I circled in blue are the things that are unique, that can be studied uniquely in Guyana that people elsewhere cannot study. So you have to take advantage of what you got and figure out what you want to do and figure out how to understand your population better. And in order to do that, you know, you got, you got to do some of your own study. Obviously, yes. yeah, and and that's why Christina is here pioneering this effort, and and then you know I'm just tagging along, let her do all the hard work, and then when she collect all the bio samples, then and then I'll, I'll start uh, thinking about what to do next. Okay, now what? So in, Christina does all her work, collects beautiful massive number of. Uh, uh, people and they get their phenotype done. And as I've been emphasizing to Dr. Cummings, you got to collect the damn samples. And then Dr. Cummings collect all the samples. Christina and other people have done all the phenotyping. And when you have a genotype and the phenotype and you connect the dots together, and then you can start understand how the biology works in Guyana population, right? So with that motivation, I'm going to show you how I'm using healthy Asian cohort that I have been doing 
uh, for the past 15 years. Uh, come on. I don't have much time. Okay, so I decided to look at lipids in, in Alzheimer's disease because of lipid was uh, lipid uh, alteration impacts amyloid processing, which causes uh, plaques in the brain. And APOE4 is a way to process the intercellular lip transport of the, the various chemicals in between neurons. So this is, if you were to look at the, the molecular biology dogma, where you go from gene to mRNA to protein to uh, uh, post-translational, whatever chemical small molecules that you're gonna get, go through this whole process. And, and most studies look at the gene and the phenotype association. And that is really bad because Imagine each time you have a correlation, and let's say the correlation coefficient is 0.9, but each time when there are five steps, it's 0.9 to the fifth power, which is gonna cut you correlation down to 55% or something. So what we have done is we are dissecting this thing so that, work with me. Anyway, uh, what it's supposed to do is, it's supposed to show all the arrow pointing this way and that way. Oh, it's, there you go. Now we pick the lipids that cause Alzheimer's disease, and then we narrow down from 188 lipids to a, a restricted number of lipids. And then we look to see which genes are associated with those lipids that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we dissect things in a way, and then when we once we find the gene that is associated with lipid level, then we do a transcriptomic analysis to see whether there is a differential expression level at that gene with respect to lipids. So all these things, we are dissecting a le one layer at a time and try to look at the whole thing. So here we're, we are showing uh, in the previous picture, we dissected through 180 different lipids and we identified X, about 10 lipids that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And there's about two big clusters of lipids that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And then uh, we, oh, come on. And then for each of these lipids, we do the genome analysis, as you can see, all those 10 lipids being the phenotypic endpoint, we were able to identify three genetic locations, chromosome 4, 11, and 15. And once we do that, so I'm going to give you one example. Chromosome 15. So another presentation coming in. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I, and anyway, we found this gene and we confirmed in Down syndrome. And, and summary is that do your own study, think about design and keep the samples and you will have uh, successful things down the pipe. That's it, folks. All right, one question. Yeah. Um, this Alzheimer's long term and short term. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think that the, the short term is an obvious one that you can detect. The long term, people still remember even when they're going through cognitive impairments. So, but, you know. There are things that uh, you're supposed to be teaching, you know, uh, puzzles and stuff, always train your. And one thing that we discovered was that even people who have PS mutation, those who exercise, the progression of cognitive decline is slower. So 
you know, we play puzzles and, and then walk 30 minutes every day and then that will keep you. Yes, sir. Yes, so we did find a difference in diabetic and then diabetic vision. Oh, that's a study it being done by Jose Lischinger, a friend of mine at Columbia. So he's going to tell you, you know, he's spending $100 million to do that. That's not, you know, but I'm sure I am. The literature is saying uh, Yes, yes, yes. So, but he's trying to see whether if you provide medication that prevents diabetes, will those people have a lower risk of Alzheimer's? That's what he studied. So, yes, sir. How can you get a copy of this presentation? Uh, I, I don't know that. That's number one. Number two. Are you looking for volunteers? For what? <laughs> the Guyana study of Alzheimer's. She, she's the one who's looking doing the whole, whole Guyana study. So can we speak nicely to her? Yeah, be nice to her. Always be nice to her. Because you're, you're going to be in trouble if you're not. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, so nice. Nice.